troubles. It's late at night. Suddenly, he feels a knife to his throat, and he hears a voice in his ear. Tell me quick, are you a Protestant or are you a Catholic? The guy thinks fast. I'm an atheist. <laughs> a moment of silence. The knife doesn't move. The voice says, a Protestant atheist or a Catholic? <laughs> That saves me half my work because the topic is the question and the speech is the answer. And it's much harder to get questions out and to formulate them and to really passionately search through them than most people think. And it's much easier to find answers than most people think. The world is full of answers. What's difficult is that they're so confusing. So I'm asked to talk about Is Jesus for Everyone? New evangelization in the new postmodern world. Okay, there's four questions here. First, what's evangelization? Second, why is it for everyone? Third, what's new about the new evangelization? And fourth, uh, what is this new world, this postmodern world? Well, as most of you know, evangelization comes from the Greek word evangelium, from which we get our word evangel or evangelical, and it means good news or the gospel. What is the good news? The good news is Jesus Christ. I was once talking to a bunch of priests in a seminary in Connecticut, and they were, they were I thought, very wise and very holy. They were in a, a monastery, and the abbot was a, an old, wise, holy man. Uh, afterwards, we had a great question and answer session, and I was ready to go, and he said, wait, uh, we've got to ask you one more question. Uh, every visitor that we have here, we ask this question to. I said, all right, what's your last question? He said, uh, if God said to you that he would give you any one gift for us, what would you ask? And I thought, that's such a good question, I can't fake that. I'm just going to blurt out the first thing that comes to my mind. So I said, well, I would ask that he would make every single one of you fall totally in love with Jesus Christ for every second for the rest of your life. They all started to laugh. And they were very holy people. They weren't laughing at me. Uh, they were laughing gently. And the abbot explained to me, we're not laughing at you. The reason we're laughing is, last month Mother Teresa's here. That was her answer, too. <laughs> So I knew that was pretty good. That was the time inspiration. Well, that's the whole point of evangelization. Evangelization is spreading the good news. And it's not just news. It's like spreading an infection. You actually have this disease, but it's a good disease. And you, you spread it. You, you, you contact people with it. And eventually, it's like the invasion of the body snatchers. <laughs> Eventually, he snatches all the bodies. And until he does, they're not finished. The Great Commission did not come with a tag saying, this applies to the clergy only. This is the reason for the church's existence. This is the whole point of what the church is. The church is those who are called out of the world and into Christ to spread Christ back into the world. And it does that in a number of ways. First of all, it does it by words. Because in the beginning was the Word. St. Francis of Assisi famously said, preach the gospel, use the words when necessary. Which means there's other ways. Both Protestants and Catholics speak of the formula word and sacrament. The church is itself a sacrament, the big sacrament. An actual sign that effects what it signifies. The meaning of the word sacrament is a sacred sign instituted by Christ that doesn't just signify, but actually does or effects what it signifies. So it's the presence of Christ in his people. It's the body of Christ. And the relation between Christ and his body is not like the relation between a CEO and his organization. That's one meaning of head, namely boss. Christ is not our boss, he's our head. 
And if you think of your head as 16 feet in the air, uh, commanding the body like a, a puppet, you better see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's how many of us see the relation between Christ and the church. But there's a third way in which we evangelize, not just by words and not just by sacramental presence, but also by being ourselves, by being Christ, by being saints. The call to sanctity did also did not come with a, a, a PS. This applies only to mystics, or this applies only to monks, or this applies only to a, a small minority of people. The French Catholic novelist and playwright, Léon Blois, almost always put a line into each of his plays that said something like this, there is only one tragedy in life not to be a saint. Uh, Jesus himself commanded that. He didn't say, uh, this would be nice if some of you attained this ideal. He said, you, meaning all of us, must be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. He's not going to stop until he gets what he wants. George MacDonald said, uh, God our Father, like a good human father, is very easy to please and very hard to satisfy. That's why we Catholics believe in purgatory. You Protestants don't have to call it purgatory. We're not hung up, not hung up on the word, but God is not going to let us finish until he's finished with us. That's for sure. MacDonald also said, the notion that Jesus saves us from hell, from damnation, from punishment, from the consequences of our sins. That is a mean and selfish notion. He's not called Savior because he saves us simply from the consequences of our sins. He is called Savior because he will save us from our sins. That's part of the Gospel. It's not that the Gospel is just about justification and then we add sanctification. It's about sanctification too. Well, many of us have not heard the gospel, even though we may have been in church all our life. And I'm sure you Protestants can have equivalents of this, but let me tell you that the saddest experience in, in my teaching life as a Catholic, I teach at Boston College, uh, and the students uh, say that BC, Boston College, which stands for barely Catholic, <laughs> and one of, the, one of the things I do to my students is I give them questionnaires so that I can get to know them better, like what's your favorite book, stuff like that. Uh, and I add a lot of questions that they don't see coming, and one of them is the question that is quite familiar to evangelicals, but not so much to Catholics. Namely, if you were to die tonight and meet God, and he said to you, why should I let you into heaven, how would you answer it? I've done that about 10 times with incoming freshman students, and I never have more than 5%, in fact, I often have 0%, even mention Jesus Christ. That is an absolute scandal. That means that we have been disastrous failures at evangelization. That means these kids don't even know how to get to heaven. They may get in, but they'll get in as good pagans. Most of them give the world's worst possible answer, namely the answer that the Pharisees gave. We're the only people Jesus ever got mad at. Lord, I thank you that I fast twice a day, and I give money to the poor, and I am compassionate, and I have never normally hurt anybody, and I've tried to lead a good life. I, 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 I. What? Have we been teaching these kids? We may have well have just kept silent. Because the answer, I don't know, is a much better answer than the answer they give. Well, as a Catholic, I think that taught me something positive as well as something negative. As a Catholic, I believe the Catholic Church is true. The only reason for believing anything is that it's true. It's the only honest reason. And this is not, I think, compromising my Catholic faith at all. But I believe that the fundamental reason for the Protestant Reformation and the reason God doesn't heal 
that terrible wound, which we all, whoever we are, must pray is healed because uh, a tear in the body of Christ is, is terrible. And Christ himself <laughs> prayed with passion uh, in John 17, his high priestly prayer, that they may all be one. So he continues to agonize over this. And if you read 1 Corinthians 1, you find that St. Paul had a zero tolerance for denominationalism. I think the reason uh, God allowed the Reformation and continues it to, continues to, uh, to allow this split in this church is that the Catholic Church hasn't yet caught up with Martin Luther. I'm not talking about his theological doctrines, I'm talking about the fundamental reason that justified him in his own mind uh, for leaving the Catholic Church. That had never been done before. Even the split in 1054 was not nearly as radical as the Protestant Reformation, because the Eastern Orthodox churches have kept the same creeds, the same sacraments, the only thing they don't have is the authority of the Pope, which is a relatively minor thing. But Protestantism has been split into over 20,000 different denominations. That's certainly the most serious rend or split in the history of the church. What justified that? One thing, most Catholics didn't know how to get to heaven. They didn't know Jesus Christ personally. That doesn't mean necessarily emotionally. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to pinpoint a time in your life where you've had this peak experience. Uh, it means something deeper than that. It means touching a person and being transformed in your being by that person. I think most Catholics have been theologized and ecclesiologized and sacramentalized without being evangelized. That is, we've got a beautiful building and the foundation is, is questionable. That's absurd. That's going to change. It is changing. Amazing things are happening. If you ask any evangelical, Check me if I'm wrong here. Got hundreds of you here. What's the main reason you're not a Roman Catholic? What's the main reason you think that Protestants are right, that Luther was right? Take pick pick one doctrine. There's many, many things, but one thing alone. Justification by faith, right? You gotta know how to get to heaven. Well, none of the other issues have been solved yet. Not sola scriptura, not the authority of the church, not infallibility, not hope, sacraments, Mary. But that one's been solved. I hope you've kept up with the news. A miracle has happened. Something that nobody expected 50 years ago has happened. Namely, that Lutherans and Catholics at the highest possible level have agreed that there is no substantive essential contradiction between Luther's teaching and the Catholic's teaching on justification. Well, for hundreds of years, we consigned each other's bodies to battlefield graves and each other's souls to hell over that issue. And now, suddenly, we said, there's no difference? What happened? Did we compromise? No, either side compromised. What happened was, instead of explaining further, and putting more branches out on the tree, and more leaves, and more explanations, and more doctrines, and more doctrines that explain old doctrines, which is a perfectly honest and legitimate thing to do. Instead, we went backwards. We went back to the roots of the tree. We went back to the church fathers, and to scripture, and to Christ himself. And we said, well, wait a minute, we go back to the unity that we had. There was no dispute about it. It's, it's sort of all one thing. And until you see that all one thing, until you see the, uh, the single trunk of the tree, you can't really understand why the branches are different. Paul, in Romans and Galatians, clearly says we are justified by faith, not by the works of the law. That's what Luther said. James clearly says in his epistle, we are not justified by faith alone, but by works. 
And Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, uh, speaking of faith, hope, and charity, which means not a feeling, but fundamentally the work of charity, both inner and outer, uh, does not rank faith the highest, but charity. So what is it? Is it faith or is it the works of love that justifies you? Well, it depends on what you mean by justification. If you mean by justification, just getting to heaven, then faith alone can justify you as it did to the good thief. He had no time for good works. All he had is an act of faith, and Jesus said today, you will with me, be with me in paradise. But if justification means being made totally right with God, being what God in tends you to be and insist that you be, that means becoming a saint. And that necessarily includes charity and the works of charity. And if by faith you mean simply intellectual faith, then justification by faith is not true. And the Bible clearly says that. James says, do you have faith that there is one God? Ooh, good for you. The demons have that faith too. They shall be with fear. But if you mean by faith, the act by which you, from the heart, the very center of your being, accept Christ into your life, that is salvation. So, once you look back at Scripture as the source of both traditions, and sort out its language system, you realize that each side was picking a certain passage and a certain meaning, and developing its theology correctly from that, but misunderstanding the other. Now, those of you who know anything about this issue and those of you who know anything about theology will realize that I've vastly oversimplified a very complex and mysterious issue. But that's good. That's useful. That's what a roadmap does. A roadmap does not tell you every address and every little street, but it guides you. So I hope that's what I've done on this issue. Okay, so evangelization is just spreading the good infection. And you can't spread what you don't have. Uh, if you don't know Christ yourself, know, not just intellectually, but personally, if you speak French, connaître, uh, not savoir, or if you speak German, kennen, not wissen. The English language is so weak, it doesn't have all those distinctions. If you don't know it, you can't spread it. So the very first thing, the foundation of everything, is that. And that had better be very clearly in place. Well, the next question is, why is this evangelization thing for everybody? And the answer, of course, is that Jesus is for everybody. He's not just for Jews. He's not just for uh, Western civilization. He's for everybody because he is, according to the Bible itself, the light that enlightens every man who comes into the world. John 1, verse 9. Everybody. Well, what about other religions then? He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through me. So John 14, 6 seems very exclusivistic, and John 1, 9 seems very inclusivistic. What's going on there? Well, as with the issue of faith and works, you have to gather all your data. You have to be very scientific when you look at the Bible. Any scientist who blinkers his eyes at one piece of data which doesn't fit his preconceived theory and just looks at the other part of the data is being a bad scientist. And Christian theology has data. It's called divine revelation. And it's in scripture. And you have to look at all the data and get them together. Is there free will? Is there predestination? Yes. How do you get them together? Well, you certainly don't get them together by ignoring either part of the data. And if you can't quite get them together yet, just keep working at it until you do. Okay, so is Christianity exclusivistic? Yeah, Jesus is the only Savior. That's why Christians can't participate in a kind of relativistic humanism. Well, Jesus is our Savior, and Muhammad is your Savior, and Buddha is your Savior. That won't do. That's a betrayal of Christ. On the other hand, everybody knows of Jesus Christ. Atheists know Jesus Christ. Buddhists know Jesus Christ, not by name. But he himself says, or this Apostle John says, he enlightens every man who comes into the world. Why? 
because he's not just a human being. This central doctrine of traditional orthodox conservative supernaturalistic Christianity is the only foundation for a very liberal and ecumenical uh, hope for the salvation of non-Christians. And it's all in Romans 1 and 2, where, where Paul says, even the pagans who have never heard the gospel, they know God because they have reason and conscience. And that's not just a human power. That's a participation in the mind of God and in the heart of God. And when you, when you see the order in nature, you're seeing the work of God. And when your conscience tells you there's an absolute obligation to be good and not evil, that's a prophet sent from God. And all our knowledge of God comes through Christ. He says that himself. No one can know the Father but by me. So when Socrates knows all these great moral and ethical and, and philosophical truths, Jesus Christ is illuminating him. He's in contact with Christ. It's not that Christ is just a 33-year-long, six-foot-high Jewish carpenter known by a few thousand Jews. He's the mind and heart of God known by every single human being who is a human being who has ever been born into the world. Well, what does that mean about who's going to be saved? We have no idea. When the disciples asked Jesus, Lord, are many going to be saved? They probably thought, let's see, if he says it's 10%, we'll sweat. If he says it's 90%, we'll relax. If he says it's 50%, we'll be a little confused. But at least we'll have the data. Before he goes back, let's get some comparative population statistics about that and help. You recall his answer? Strive to enter in. Wrong question. We're told what we need to know. So we have no idea. We know the way. We don't know how many people are going to make it to the end. So we serve everybody. There's only two religions in the world which have been directly commanded by their scriptures to convert the entire world. That's Christianity and Islam. Jews don't send out missionaries because Reformed Jews, secular Jews, have nothing to say. They're sort of like Unitarians. And uh, Orthodox Jews believe that only when the Messiah comes will the whole world learn of the true God. Well, half the world has learned of the true God, the Jewish God, through the Messiah. That's a very powerful argument for the fact that he has come. You know the classic joke, I'm sure, what happens when you clone together a Unitarian and a Jehovah's Witness. What kind of person emerges? And the answer is a missionary who knocks on every door and has nothing to say. <laughs> Insult you too. <laughs> I love I love Canadians. It's so funny. You sit there and smile when we Americans insult you. I was born 18 miles from New York City. I'm an expert at insults. You're so apologetic. You even apologize for apologizing. Please abuse me. That's okay, just don't keep saying it to your government. <laughs> Next question. What's new about the new evangelization? Well, it's not a new evangel. It's a new isation. Jesus Christ is ever old and ever new. He's unchanging and he changes everything. And we, his disciples, are like the householder who pulls out of his store old things and new things. That refutes both conservatism and progressivism. Both philosophies try to tell the truth with the clock. One says, if it's new, it's true. The other says, if it's new, it's false. That's simply stupid. Clocks are for telling time, not truth. Well, what is new then? Not a new savior, not a new gospel, but a new need. Uh, the world is a post-Christian world. We are not living in a Christian society. Uh, if you didn't know that, I welcome you back from your nice vacation on the moon. <laughs> um, 
We have already seen in the church many agencies that are responding to that new need, both among Protestants and among Catholics. We've seen, for instance, the Navigators. We've seen Focus, a group of Catholic missionaries who send out missionaries to uh, the new darkest Africa, universities. <laughs> Not only do we have a new need, we have new methods. Technology keeps changing and almost automatically progresses. And it's right for the church to keep up with all these new methods and means. It's neutral, they're not evil, they're not necessarily good. So the social media, for instance, offers a, a, an enormous opportunity for new good or new evil. So we've got to step in before the enemy steps in. There's also a new actor, a new subject, as well as a new object. Not only is there a new need and new objects to the world, but the people who evangelize, who are they? Well, we used to think those are missionaries, or those are, are priests and monks and nuns, or those are professional teachers, those are the clergy. No, they're the laity. The clergy are there to serve the laity, not vice versa. If you could choose between tragedy number one, Every single ordained minister and priest and nun would die. <clears throat> or tragedy number two, every single lay person would die. The whole world would be full of nothing but ordained ministers and priests and nuns. Which would be more ridiculous? The second would not be. You had no church. You'd have a restaurant with no customers. But a customer without a restaurant can still make some sort of a restaurant. So it's the laity, mainly, that are doing the new evangelization. In other words, everybody. But finally, what's this new audience? What's this new postmodern world? Why do we call it postmodern? What does that mean? Well, as those of you who have studied history must know, uh, everybody, as far as I know, still basically divides the history of Western civilization into three eras, ancient, medieval, and modern. We're no longer in any of those eras. We're no longer in the modern world. The modern world is dead. The modern world is basically uh, the world of the Renaissance and the Enlightenment and the optimism that emerged from scientific and technological progress uh, and the development of, of human reason as the way of solving all human problems and the reliance on, on humanism and on human effort. Uh, and that died. It died in Hiroshima and it died in Auschwitz and it died in Flanders Fields. And it's dying all around us. So what's postmodern? Well, we don't know. We know what's not. It's not modern. Before ancient civilization arose, there were thousands and thousands of years of human history. What we mean by ancient civilization is basically classical Greco-Roman civilization. Civilizations that were like shining beacons in, in a world of, of primitivism and barbarism. But that primitivism and barbarism had very little structure. There's a lot of things you can learn from it. I don't mean to insult it, but uh, it was a little bit of everything. And then emerged something very definite, Greco-Roman civilization, which joined with Judeo-Christian civilization to produce medieval civilization, which is essentially a marriage of those two. And then the marriage came apart in the Renaissance and the Reformation. And the secular part of it produced the modern world. And now we're in the postmodern world, which means what? Which means we're back in the primitive situation, we don't know where we are. Everybody is confused. I teach philosophy. It's very easy to teach ancient philosophy. It's got a nice storyline. It's even easier to teach medieval philosophy. It has a nice unified storyline. It's pretty easy to teach even modern philosophy. That has a storyline, although it's a little more complicated. But what's contemporary philosophy? What are the main geniuses? What are the main ideologies 
uh, what are the main issues? Well, it's all sorts of stuff. Nobody knows. The still currently fashionable philosophy in most Western universities is some brand of deconstructionism. And I can't tell you what deconstructionism is because I don't understand it, and I don't think they do themselves. You know the joke about the, uh, the, the mafia godfather uh, who uh, married a deconstructionist uh, wife, and they had children who grew up to make their parents an offer they couldn't understand. <laughs> As far as I can tell, deconstructionism says the only truth is if there's no truth, and I'm certain that nobody's certain, and the only thing that's absolute is that there are no absolutes, and the only thing you should believe is that there's one thing that you shouldn't believe, and that's that you should believe anything. Uh, it makes no sense. It seems crazy. It says that words aren't really meaningful. They're, they're, they're little matches that you stick in people's brains and you light them to be, control their behavior. They're not labels that tell you what's there. They're neither true nor false. Except those words. So that makes very little sense. Actually, my mother wouldn't like what I just said. Because she used to say to me, if you can't say something nice about somebody, don't say anything at all. Well, we're in that crazy, very confused world. And that's a mission field. A world that's very clear is not a mission field. That's why it's very hard to convert Muslims. They think they have a very hard-nosed, set-in-stone kind of truth. And there's something admirable about that. But in the Western world, we're all confused. Well, that's, that's the field's way right unto harvest. The gospel is the answer to confusion. We better be taking advantage of that. Well, the world is also uh, a global village now. But the whole global village is becoming westernized and becoming Americanized. Everybody wants to be like us. And we naively think, oh, isn't that wonderful? Let's export us to the rest of the world. And I may shock you, but one of the reasons I admire Muslim civilization uh, in a way that there's no other identifiable civilization in the world that I admire as much is that it resists that. It says, no, I'm sorry, uh, we're, uh, we're not in the market for what you've got to offer, because what you've got to offer is decadence. We got something else. I don't believe that what they have is, is what they think it is, the Word of God, but they, they definitely got something else. That's why they're our rivals. They're, they've got a gospel too, and they're commanded to preach it. Uh, that's why Islam and Christianity have made more converts than any other religion. This Western world has lost not only faith, but the very sense of the sacred. I teach a course called Philosophy of Human Sexuality. And a book that I like to use in that course is a book by one of C.S. Lewis's students, Christopher Derrick, called Sex and Sacredness. The point of the book is that we're so confused about sex that we, because we have lost the sense of the sacred. Uh, a sense, uh, an intuition, uh, a kind of a, a, a smell, a kind of a preconceptual understanding is often the presupposition of, of much that is conscious and rational, and that's the case here. Every civilization in the entire history of the world, without a single exception, has thought that at least two things were sacred, sex and death. That's why they're surrounded both with taboos and ceremonies and, and religion had a lot to say about them. Suddenly, that's gone. In one place and one place only, Western civilization, that is Europe and North America. That is a much more radical change than the prevalence of atheism. Because atheism just deals with conscious belief. 
This is a whole mental power that seems to be disappearing. When I use that book, which tries to restore the sense of the sacred with regard to sex, it's a spectacular failure. Nobody understands it. Yeah, this is nice. Yeah, we should say this. This is the way to get an A on your test. But we don't get it. I didn't want to do this, but I think I should. I just read yesterday in Touchstone Magazine uh, an article about Halifax. And I'm sure you're familiar with this, but the, the take on it, I think, is, is so relevant. And I think this is a kind of a providential thing. Sometimes I feel the angels moving the scenery on the chessboard. This is from Touchstone Magazine, a kind of news article with comment by Anthony Esselin. A few days ago, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, a teenage girl was taken off life support. She had hanged herself. Driven to it by two years of humiliation at the hands of the worthy young people in that wealthy and progressive city. The facts in the case are hard to determine because the event that brought on the suicide was not fully investigated by the police. The girl, I will call her Jane Smith, was at a party at a friend's house. It wasn't a party at which you play Frankie Avalon records and dance and eat ice cream and talk about the baseball team. It was a party at which you get yourself blind, drunk, or stoned on pot and do disgraceful things in public in a state of nudity. That's what Jane did, and it was not a new thing in her life. According to testimony accepted by both the Crown, which is now prosecuting two of the four boys accused of rape, and the defendants, there were at least half a dozen young teenagers at the party having sexual intercourse. Well, that's not shocking. That goes on in America just as much as in Canada. It goes on on the campus of Boston College. It's all the hookup culture. It's very difficult to shock young people nowadays, but telling the truth is the best way to do it. And sometimes I tell my students, uh, to the boys, welcome to the place of your dreams. Welcome to Boston College. This is a free whorehouse. Nobody's refuted that. They're, they don't like it, but nobody's refuted it. That's what it is. Jane's friend told police at the same time that she had tried to get Jane to leave, but she wouldn't. She had already had intercourse with two boys, and she was fairly drunk. The friend left the party and returned with her mother. Still, they could not persuade Jane to leave, so they gave up. But the boys didn't. Sometime later that night, while Jane was vomiting out the window, one of the boys took a picture of another boy penetrating her from behind and posted it on social media. The word social is not really put into quotation marks there. <laughs> when Jane learned about the photo, she went to the police and claimed she had been raped. The police determined there wasn't sufficient evidence for prosecution. The girls at her school turned against her and called her a slut. Boys texted her and subjected her to obscene taunts and proposals. So she left Halifax for a while and received psychological treatment. But she returned to Halifax and to that hotbed of hard-heartedness, cruelty, lust, and revenge known as Coal Harbor District High School. And that proves fatal for her. What strikes me in this case is that there is not a single sensible adult in sight. Everyone is calling for the law and school programs, the arm of the law, to do something, something, anything, to keep such tragedies from occurring again. Says Marilyn Moore, we're to blame because the boys haven't learned to respect women. She's the provincial minister in charge of women's issues. But these boys have been drilled in feminist dogma since kindergarten. They've also been taught, since they were still singing boy soprano, that sex is for recreation as long as you top off the banana split with a bell of responsibility. A faint towards niceness, having nothing to do with marrying or having children, or perish the thought, the law of God. In other words, these are the monsters you have raised, Mrs. Moore. You have made a jungle, and now you are surprised to find roots in it. The far-left premier of Nova Scotia, Daryl Dexter, wants to make it illegal for someone to post an intimate photograph without permission. Sure, whatever. Jane's mother wants to meet with the Prime Minister Stephen Harper to see to it that no girl or boy, presumably, will have to suffer what her daughter suffered. How can this happen by legal mechanism? Applied from Ottawa 2,000 miles away. 
Mrs. Smith did not address her own failure, which is much closer to home. She and Jane's father do not share the same name or the same house. It's hard to ferret out from the Halifax Chronicle Herald whether they were divorced or never married at all, which is no surprise since the feminist go-go candidate no longer bothers to keep statistics on divorce. You don't believe in marriage, you don't believe in divorce. In either case, Jane, tattooed and tongue pierced, regular party goer, living a heartless and dissipated life, held up as a model for pleasure seeking Canadian youth, never learned that there was any such thing as a connection between love and modesty or holiness or sex or the beauty and indissolubility of marriage or the raising of children. Not a single account that I've read expresses dismay that there was such a party at which people were doing such things. And does their age really matter? Does depravity, like wine, grow fine with age? The real problem is not legal. There never should have been a Jane Smith growing up without married mother and father, without moral direction, without a vision of human love oriented towards marriage and children. Nor should there have been all those depraved boys and cruel girls. But can the law mandate not love no more than it can raise the dead? Who can raise the dead? God alone. Who can not mandate, but spread love? Love alone. God is love. No secular legal solution will solve that problem ever, anywhere. So, at stake in our time and place is not merely eternal souls, as if that's a merely, but the survival of our civilization. Where are we going? Read Ready for the World. Everybody talks about it, few people have read it. It's an astonishingly prophetic book. Written by a non-believer, by the way, Aldous Huxley, in 1932, almost a century ago. It's about today. It's about, fundamentally, about the dissolution of love, human relationships, and the family, and what happens in a world where those things have disappeared. He's a prophet. The other book I think that everybody should read is C.S. Lewis's shocking book, most shocking book, The Abolition of Man. He argues that the kind of human being modern education is increasingly producing is not a man. What? Well, biologically it is, of course. Nietzsche argued that man can become Superman a new species, not biologically, but spiritually. If he ceases to believe in God, and therefore in morality, then he will not have a conscience, and he can be God himself, and this is wonderful. <coughs> and Lewis is the other side of Nietzsche. He says, Nietzsche's right. That's what we're doing. We're, we're doing a conscience activity. We're producing clever, trousered apes. And then we're surprised that they behave like apes. Well, that's something that can be solved by what? what? What less than the real presence of God can solve that deep-seated problem? Nothing. And what is the real presence of God? Jesus Christ. He who has seen me has seen the Father. So even if you're not concerned with your eternal soul, but you're concerned for your civilization, you better be a Christian. Because the appliances are going out, and that's where all the electricity is. But that means that we've got to get in touch again with the live wire, and that's scary. Sparks come out of that wire. You get too, touch, too close to that, and something happens to you. He does things to you. Aslan is not a tame lion, remember? The real presence of Christ always offends people. Jesus Christ is not a Canadian. <laughs> Jesus Christ is a lower New York East Side Jew. <laughs> P1. I like to give myself the hook early because a talk, in my experience, is only a diving board. Uh, it's a preliminary to swimming in a swimming pool, which is much more enjoyable and 
That's the whole point of the diagonal board. Uh, this is the first so-called dialogue that has only one person in it. So I don't like that. So now comes uh, something that's closer to the very life of God. God is not alone. He is not only one person. He's three persons in endless dialogue. So the question and answer session by Trinitarian standards is closer to the nature of ultimate reality than any monologue. So I will end my heresy and now uh, I, I have a question.